Did you know it? The heart of the book of Daniel is about Jesus Christ. This is Andre, your host, inviting you to another spiritual feast from the book of Daniel. Once you have mastered the messages of the book of Daniel, you will appreciate the messages of the book of Revelation much more. God bless you as you accompany Francois to the story of Daniel 7, 8 and 9. In Daniel chapter 2, we studied about the rise and the fall of the four great ancient empires. They fell because of their inhumanity to man. The prophecies of the book of Daniel bring us the good news that one day Jesus will reign as king and make a perfect success of it. God's kingdom will be populated with happy people. In Daniel chapter 7, the prophet sees a little horn coming up among the European nations and uprooting three other horns. We discovered this horn to be the papacy. The papacy is a system professing to be Christian but denying some very important principles of Christianity. If we become intolerant towards people who differ with us, we too reveal the spirit of the Antichrist. Today we are discovering Christ as the Lamb that was slain for our transgressions. Christ the High Priest that applies the benefit of his shed blood on our behalf. And Christ the King of Kings who is coming to reign one of these days. But first of all Daniel is going to tell us something about his vision of a judgment that began in heaven. Daniel 7 verses 9 and 10 As I looked, thrones were set in place, and the Ancient of Days took his seat. His clothing was white as snow, the hair of his head was white like wool, his throne was flaming with fire, and its wheels were all ablaze. A river of fire was flowing, coming out from before him. Thousands upon thousands attended him. Ten thousand times ten thousand stood before him. The court was seated and the books were opened. A mobile throne was a common phenomenon in ancient civilizations. When you visit Nebuchadnezzar's throne room, you see the platform to which the king's throne was transported during court cases. What a solemn, heavenly judgment scene. All the angels are present when your life record and mine are opened. Have you ever been summoned to appear before a magistrate or a judge? This is one of life's most frightening experiences, especially when you're guilty. Tell me, how many of God's commandments have you transgressed during your lifetime? How many hurts have you caused? I don't think our cases look too good in the judgment. Is there hope for you and me? Deuteronomy 22 verse 15 refers to the elders of the gate. All the ancient cities like Chasor, Gezer, Samaria and others had these gates and they served as court rooms. In Old Testament times the defense of the accused was a duty so sacred that the judge refused to delegate the work to an attorney. He himself served as the defender of the accused, how different to our legal system. This is the good news of the heavenly judgment. Our judge, God the Father, serves as the defender of guilty you and me, the accused. The Jewish Encyclopedia explains, attorneys at law are unknown in Jewish law. Their legal code required judges to lean always to the side of the defendant and give him the advantage of every possible doubt. While looking at the ruins of the courtroom at the city gate of Lakish, I want you to imagine the witnesses of the crime pressing their charges while the judge promoted the case of the defendant, biased in favor of acquittal. Revelation 12.10 speaks of the devil as the accuser who accuses us before God day and night. How do we survive his painfully correct accusations? They overcame him by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of their testimony. When you and I accept the fact that Jesus died in our stead, God finds the evidence he needs to pronounce us innocent. In certain situations, the Hebrew judge appointed an advocate to assist him in defending the accused. 
The Jewish Encyclopedia states that the husband could represent his wife and help the judge defend her if the verdict involved his personal rights. Here we have a glorious parallel with the heavenly judgment. Christ the bridegroom purchased us, his bride, with his precious blood. He serves as our court-appointed advocate to help the Father defend us from Satan. He also defends his own right to take us up to heaven. My dear friend, if the devil or any earthly being tells you that you are a hopeless case, please don't believe them. And even if you had given up on yourself, God has not. Your eternal salvation does not depend on how hopeless you are, but on Christ's sufficiency to save sinners. 1 John chapter 2 verse 1 My dear children, I write this to you that you will not sin. But if anybody does sin, we have one who speaks to the Father in our defense, Jesus Christ the Righteous One. He is the atoning sacrifice for our sins, and not only for ours, but also for the sins of the whole world. Dear friends, we will all have to face the judgment, but we have nothing to fear when Jesus is our advocate. I enjoy reading those passages of scripture where it says that Jesus will come with the clouds of heaven. Clouds usually refer to his deity and the angels that will accompany him. Did you know that when Jesus entered the pre-advent judgment scene as described by the prophet Daniel, he was also accompanied by the majestic clouds of angels? Daniel 7.13 In my vision at night I looked, and there before me was one like a son of man. Coming with the clouds of heaven, he approached the Ancient of Days and was led into his presence. I have good news for you. Jesus is in the heavenly courtroom where our cases are being investigated. He has never yet lost a case where the accused admitted his guilt, asked for forgiveness and repented. Something very special is going to happen to Jesus once he finishes mediating on behalf of repentant sinners. He is going to receive kingship. Let's read about it from Daniel 7 verse 14. He was given authority, glory and sovereign power. All people, nations and men of every language worshipped him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion that will not pass away and his kingdom is one that will never be destroyed. If I study the books of Daniel and Revelation and all I see are beasts and horns and prophetic time, I have missed the point. The main theme of these books is Jesus Christ, the crucified Lamb, the risen High Priest and the coming King. Daniel 7.22 says that the Ancient of Days came and pronounced judgment in favor of the saints of the Most High, and the time came when they possessed the kingdom. In order for Jesus to qualify as king, he first had to become a priest. And before Jesus could become a priest, he had to become a lamb slain for the sins of the world. In Daniel chapter 8 we get additional information concerning the good news of the judgment. We are going to listen to the astounding news that God is even going to destroy the record of our confessed sins. In Daniel chapter 9 we are going to look at the cross from Daniel's perspective. He even gives us the exact date when Jesus would be baptized and crucified. I can hardly wait to share this exciting news with you. But before we get to the Christ-centered heart of the book of Daniel, I must first take you to Susa, the royal capital of the ancient Elamites. In the time of the Persian kings, it was used as a winter palace. Let me read from Daniel 8 verses 1 and 2 while you're looking at the site. In the third year of King Belshazzar's reign, I, Daniel, had a vision after the one that had already appeared to me. Verse 2, In my vision I saw myself in the capital of Susa in the province of Elam. In the vision I was beside the Ulai Canal. What a thrill to visit such an historic place. In the foreground you see the Ulai Canal and the cone-like building in the background is the tomb of the prophet Daniel. Daniel chapter 8 verses 3 and 4 
I looked up, and there before me was a ram with two horns standing beside the canal, and the two horns were long. One of the horns was longer than the other, but grew up later. Verse 4 I watched the ram as he charged towards the west and the north and the south. No animal could stand against him, and none could rescue from his power. He did as he pleased and became great. The day I visited Susa, I saw this ram next to the Ulai Canal. What a vivid reminder of the ram Daniel saw in his vision. But why do we have a symbol of a ram in this vision? Well, God wants us to focus our attention on the ancient sacrificial system where these animals were sacrificed. By the way, whenever you study the sacrificial system of the Old Testament, you will be blessed. Why? Because it points to another lamb that would one day be slain for sinners like you and me. If ever you want to discover Jesus in a multifaceted way, study the ancient tabernacle services. When I survey the wondrous cross on which the Prince of Glory died, my riches gain I count but loss and pour contempt on all my pride. Let's go back to Daniel's vision of the ram at the Ulai Canal. We are in Iran, formerly called Medo Persia. Would you like to guess which civilization the ram represents? Daniel 8 verse 20 has the answer. The two-horned ram that you saw represents the kings of Media and Persia. Verse 4 says, He did as he pleased and became great. During the last few years of Daniel's life, he saw the mighty accomplishments of Cyrus the Great. I'm sure the vision of the ram also reminded Daniel of the silver chest and arms of the huge image and the bear of the vision of the fierce beasts. While you're looking at the remains of the mighty Persian empire of Cyrus the Great, I want to ask you a question. What happened to the silver or the bear kingdom of chapters 2 and 7 which represents the Medo persia empire? Well, history tells us they were conquered by the Greeks. We've already seen in verse 20 that the ram represents the Medo persian empire. Can we expect the same Greek power to come and destroy the ram kingdom? Yes. Daniel saw this in vision, so let's read from verse 5. As I was thinking about this, suddenly a goat with a prominent horn between his eyes came from the west, crossing the whole earth without touching the ground. Who is this goat kingdom? Daniel 8.21 The shaggy goat is the king of Greece, and the large horn between his eyes is the first king. What a dramatic vision. One world empire confronting another world empire. Who's going to win the battle? Daniel 8 verse 6, he came towards the two-horned ram I had seen standing beside the canal and charged at him in great rage. Verse 7, I saw him attack the ram furiously, striking the ram and shattering his two horns. The ram was powerless to stand against him. The goat knocked him to the ground and trampled on him, and none could rescue the ram from his power. You're looking at the tombs of the Medo Persian kings at Naqsh e Rustam. History tells us how the Greek army of Alexander the Great finally defeated the mighty Persian army at Irbil in Iraq. One Bible commentator gives us the following reason for the defeat of the Persians The Medo Persian realm was visited by the wrath of heaven because in it God's law had been trampled underfoot. Comes from Prophets and Kings, page 502. Ages before Alexander the Great conquered the Medo Persian Empire, Daniel saw him in vision and prophesied what was going to happen to his Macedonian Empire. Daniel 8 verse 8 The goat became very great, but at the height of his power his large horn was broken off, and in its place four prominent horns grew up towards the four winds of heaven. The great horn, Alexander the Great, was broken off and died in Babylon in 323 BC. Now, who are the four horns that took his place? The Bible speaks. Verse 22 The four horns that replaced the one that was broken off 
represent four kingdoms that will emerge from his nation but will not have the same power. Alexander's empire was divided into four parts, Lesimachus, Cassander, Seleucus and Ptolemy, each got a part. Just as the Bible predicted, so it happened. As the vision continues, Daniel sees another little horn emerging from one of the four winds. As he looks at this little horn, he sees some resemblances to the previous little horn he saw in vision. Listen as the prophet describes the next world empire. Verse 9 says, Out of one of them, the four winds of heaven, verse 8, came another horn, which started small but grew in power to the south and to the west and towards the beautiful land. Let me tell you something of great interest. The fourth beast, pagan Rome, the ten horns, the ten European kingdoms and the little horn, the papacy, are all represented by one little horn in chapter 8. The next event in chapter 7 is the judgment that sits and takes away the little horn's dominion. And in chapter 8 the sanctuary is cleansed. The little horn is broken without hand. Chapter 7 concludes with the good news that the saints of the Most High will possess the kingdom. Chapters 9 to 12 are a continuation of Gabriel's interpretation begun in chapter 8 and climaxing in the final deliverance of God's people. Daniel 8 verse 10 tells us more about this horn kingdom. It grew until it reached the host of the heavens and it threw some of the starry host down to the earth and trampled on them. This sounds like persecution, but let's read the explanation from verse 24 to find out who exactly this persecuted host of heaven is. He will destroy the mighty men and the holy people. The host of heaven is another term for God's followers, his holy people. Did pagan Rome destroy mighty men and holy people? Yes. In the Colosseum at Rome, they were thrown to the lines and then set alight. And what about papal Rome? Did they persecute mighty and holy people? Yes. The monument at Franchhoek testifies of the massacre of millions of Albigenses, Waldensians and Huguenots. Verse 11. It set itself up to be as great as the Prince of Hosts. He took away the daily sacrifice from him and the place of his sanctuary was brought low. Prince of Host sounds like Christ. But we must be on the safe side and ask verse 25 to give us an explanation. When they feel secure, he will destroy many and take his stand against the Prince of Princes. There is only one Prince of Princes and that is Jesus Christ our Lord. He is also the Prince of Peace and we need to invite him daily into our restless lives. Isaiah 9, 6 His name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. In what way did the horn of Daniel 8, pagan Rome, stand against Christ our Prince? Daniel 11.22 gives us more information and explains that the Prince of the Covenant will be destroyed. Did pagan Rome destroy Christ? Yes, they crucified our Prince of Peace. Who passed the death sentence? Pontius Pilate. Can archaeology confirm it? Yes. A marvellous discovery was made at the ancient Roman theatre of Caesarea in 1961. The name of Pilate appears on it. The top line mentions Tiberium, a reference to the Emperor Tiberius. The line below carries the name Pontius Pilate. In a way you are looking at the fulfillment of the prophecy of Daniel 8 that predicted that Rome would destroy the Prince of Peace. Please don't think that you are wasting precious time by studying the different symbols in the book of Daniel. The prophet is revealing startling truth. Step by step he unfolds the great drama of the ages, the conflict between Christ and Satan. Verse 11 says, It set itself up to be as great as the prince of the host. It took away the daily sacrifice from him. 
What was the daily sacrifice that the little horned pagan and papal Rome took away from Christ, the Prince of Princes? The word daily comes from the Hebrew word tamit, which means continual. By the way, the word sacrifice is not in the original. When you study the use of this word in the Old Testament, you'll discover that it is used to describe all the functions of the ancient sacrificial system. This is exciting. There was one great central theme in this God-given priestly system. What was it? Salvation by grace through Jesus Christ. Let me explain. How did this horn in its pagan phase take away the daily, the tamit, this beautiful priestly intercessory service that portrayed God's grace in saving sinners? First by crucifying Jesus and secondly by destroying the temple. And in what way did the little horn in its papal phase take away the daily, the tamit, the priestly ministry of Christ? He substituted Christ's ministry in the heavenly sanctuary with a false sacrifice called the Mass. He took away Christ as the head of the church and substituted him with the Pope, introducing a false method of salvation. But in his vision, Daniel saw how the crucified Christ would begin his work in the most holy place in the heavenly sanctuary. And the prophet saw how this beautiful message of Jesus in the heavenly sanctuary would be proclaimed to the entire world. Verse 13 Then I heard a holy one speaking, and another holy one said to him, How long will it take for the vision to be fulfilled? The vision concerning the daily sacrifice, the rebellion that causes desolation, and the surrender of the sanctuary and the host that will be trampled underfoot. One angel asks another angel, Tell me, how long will it take before the beautiful message of Jesus Christ as our only priest will be preached in all its fullness? The world so desperately needs to hear the message of Christ our lawgiver, of Christ our crucified saviour, of Christ our judge, of Christ our advocate, and of Christ our faithful high priest. So when would a purely Christ-centered message be proclaimed that would expose the false system of salvation? Daniel 8, 14, And he said to me, It'll take 2,300 evenings and mornings, then the sanctuary will be reconstructed or cleansed. The sanctuary message is the heart of the book of Daniel. This is where Jesus, our high priest, ministers on our behalf. What does the cleansing of the sanctuary mean? In order for us to better understand this marvelous prophecy, we will have to go back to the previous chapter to assist us. According to the principles of biblical interpretation, the investigative judgment of Daniel 7 and the cleansing of the sanctuary of chapter 8 are one and the same event. The two visions complement one another. We will hear more about this in our follow-up lecture. When you and I accept Jesus as our advocate and our only hope for salvation, he appears on our behalf before the Father. And what does the Father see in Christ? He sees sinless perfection. Through Jesus we are accepted by God the Father as sinless and perfect. What a thought. You cannot afford to miss the next lecture. We are not only going to study more about God's gracious way of saving sinners like you and me, we are also going to discover His marvelous solution to eradicate the record of our sins. He is going to destroy the hard disk on which our sins are recorded completely. What a God! Well, that was amazing. During our next lecture you will see me next to a goat at a place called Susa in Iran. Francois asked me to pose next to this animal to make a very valid point. Come and hear more about God's plan to forgive you fully. He not only cleanses sinners from all their guilty stains, he also cleanses the record of our sins. Don't miss out on the most Christ-centered message from the book of Daniel. Let us say a word of prayer. Dear Lord, we are so grateful that Jesus has taken our place on the cross and brought us salvation. O oh Jesus, 
the sinless one was treated as we deserve, that we, fallen and sinful, might be treated as he deserved. May we appreciate your love for us more and more and surrender to your call. In Jesus' name, Amen.